Welcome everybody to the big show. We have a great event planned for you. We could call it an event. I'm Chris Collins. This is Chris Jones. Hello, everyone. The, uh, we have an interview from Kyle Friedel, who is part of the strategy team at Interstate Battery that we're going to play for you. Christian actually wasn't here for that, so you're going to see it for the first time. But incredible interview. We, we talk about batteries. We, it's a very interesting subject and crucial to our success. And um, I even asked him about, you know, batteries and Teslas, that sort of thing. So yeah, fascinating. Also... I want to talk about the Will Smith, Chris Rock thing in the spirit of how does that apply to the service drive? And I think it does. I, ha I have a, a take on it. It also made me think like, what if I could smack you every time you told the joke that I didn't like? <laughs> That's so funny. I, I was thinking about that after that happened. I'm like, man, I got to tell you, like every time I tell a joke, I would offend at least one group of people. <laughs> like, sure. man, there's no way I don't have black and blue cheeks all day long. Then I came up with a new thing that we're going to do that is a toast. It's a toast to somebody who has made an impact in our industry. So we're going to do a shot of tequila. I know a lot of you that have come for boot camps or events uh, will always ask like, what's that tequila that we had again? So we're going to, we're going to toast that tequila here early in the morning, um, Christian doesn't drink also, so I kind of came up with this as a way to torture him, a little day drinking, but we're going to do a shot of tequila as a tribute to somebody that we will um, we will talk about coming yeah. up. It's for a good cause, ultimately, so I'm, I'm willing to take one for the team. But, you know, it kind of got me to thinking a little bit. Like, I mean, I'm in my mid-40s right now, and, I, you know, so you start to reflect on your life a little bit, and, you know, it's really interesting uh, in, in whatever, the 46 years I've been on this earth, never once have I used essential oils. It makes me wonder, are they really essential? Hey. So, welcome everybody. Did you... Um did you watch the Will Smith, Chris Rock thing? Not live, but I saw it afterwards. Yeah, I didn't either. I have no interest in that show. <laughs> Oscars are not my cup uh, of tea. It's like a beauty pageant, basically. Fixed. Seems like it's fixed. So it was interesting in the office when we talked about it. Most everybody kind of felt like it was staged, like it was fake. A lot of people feel like it was made up. Yeah, I never thought that once. No? But but I think, I personally think it's more fun if we pretend like it wasn't. Like, we don't know, right? Yeah. And I don't know that we'll ever know, but it might be more fun just to pretend like it isn't and think about it from, from that perspective. So what was, what was your thought on it? Like, what was your reaction or your take? Wow. So I think the big thing is that um, what I, what I did is first I was in a little bit of shock that the whole thing happened. And then the second is like trying to think about like, what would somebody have to do to make, to make me hit somebody? Like how far would they have to go? Yeah. Like, like what is that thing that would hit that button that says, okay, throw, throw all logic out the window and you get up and you smack somebody. Do you, do you feel like at times like the subject of kids or wife or girlfriend or whatever are off limits to a certain point. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's an interesting take. Yeah. I think, um, I think most people's initial reaction too is to punch back. Right. So like if somebody hits you, your initial reaction is to fight back. Yeah, almost like when people do that thing where you put your hand up and you start to push on them and they push back. It's a natural reaction. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, so I think that the interesting thing about it and how it applies to us is what impressed me about the whole thing. Like if you put aside like whether it should have happened or if he was right to do it or whatever and you, you just kind of put that aside – and you just think about Chris Rock's reaction. The thing that blew me away and really impressed me is when Will hits him, there's this kind of instant empathy. 
in the sense that he he was like trying to understand what was happening, but he was seeing Will more as the the outcome of something else. He wasn't reacting to the to the the violence. He was to me trying to understand what had caused it and why is this person affected so much and yeah that i was just blown away by by what a gentleman and how well he handled it in that sense and after so he he was quiet after didn't say anything bad about will didn't want him arrested like he just was trying to understand it. I think in his first stand up back, he even said like, I'm still processing it. And I think that for us, a lot of times, especially with advisors and customers, but this transcends that honestly, but with advisors and customers, when I've been in a position of authority, like a general manager, and I get a customer complaint, most of the time, the failure was that the advisor was reacting to the moment and was trying to impress on the customer why we were right. We were trying to be right instead of listening and trying to win. And so a lot of times when customers are frustrated or they're, they're overreacting to something and you're like, well, you know, why are you overreacting to this thing? It's just a car or Whatever it is, I've heard advisors say that. Well, it's just a car. You're crazy, and um, you know, calling customers crazy or customers have high expectations. I had somebody tell me the other day, like, "Oh, our customers here, they have really high expectations." And I always think when when customers have high expectations, that's the best scenario because if you meet those expectations, you have a loyalty, but you also have a a uh, bubble in what you can charge because you can charge more in those situations also. So you have price elasticity in a sense, but um, you know, just thinking about when things go wrong and customers are upset, do we, do we try to see past their initial reaction and show empathy and try to understand why they feel the way they do? Or are we reacting to the violence or the aggression? And I, I think that it, it was, it was really um, kind of touching the way that Chris Rock kind of handled himself like a leader in that situation. And he took the punch and then he, even after when Will was screaming at him, take my wife's name out of your mouth or whatever, he's like, yeah, yeah, okay. I understand. Like he wasn't, he wasn't engaging him in the sense of going toe to toe which, you know, if you think about Chris Rock and if you watch like videos online or if you've ever seen him live, he can take hecklers and dice them. Like he is, I mean, he's, he's one quick of the and, greatest. Yeah, quick and witty. And um, well-trained and in the moment, right? You got to think like he came from Saturday Night Live. Like he he's used to acting in the moment very, very quickly. But in that situation, he didn't. He didn't act quickly he uh, he tried to understand the situation for what it was, and he he didn't um, he didn't do anything that would provoke that. And so, a lot of you you know managers listening, like a lot of times when you have a customer that's complaining about something, you're thinking like this was easy. Like all I had to do was listen to the customer, and they're fine, right? And so, as a service advisor, think about that. Like, how much are you listening? How much empathy are you showing? Are you really trying to understand your customers? And then even take it a step further, how much better would your ROs be in the descriptions? And how uh, more efficient would the technicians be if they had better descriptions, if you really tried to understand customers instead of reacting or shortcutting or judging in the moment? That's so great. Yeah, I, uh, I think it's awesome that you thought about it from the service advisor perspective because I immediately went into like that what how Chris Rock reacted was a was a lesson in leadership completely. So I, I was thinking about, so as a leader, let's say you're running a service department and, and you've got a really, really upset employee that comes to you. And your first instinct, like you were just saying with the advisor and the customers, is that you want to be like, no, no, it's not really how it is. 
But the truth is, is that when you have somebody coming to you in a certain emotional state, it's really about that one thing. There's a buildup. And if you want, even want to say that it's a story and recognizing as a leader that your customers, your employees, uh, other managers, everyone's got a story to tell. And it's not necessarily for us to say what's right or wrong, but to hear the story and then take people in for the story that they are, you are way better of a leader. And the other thing that hit me like a ton of bricks is I've always thought that leaders that have the best control of their emotions are the ones that you want to follow. People that aren't going to go too high, not going to go too low, but stay the course are the ones that, that really increase followership. Yeah, because once you've reacted to somebody, then you're giving them control and you and, can't take it back. Yeah. You're way better to do like Chris Rock and just hold it back and not give not give anything, just absorb. And um, then, you know, you're you're going to be way more effective in whatever your response is because it's not an automatic reaction. It's not out of emotion. So, yeah. no, I agree with that, too. Yeah, it's like it's a huge leadership thing in the sense of um, he showed he showed a lot of leadership in that. Like, I was impressed. Like. You just look at his face like it's just instant like, whoa, like, I don't know how close they are. I've heard that they're friends, but just his like, whoa, this guy's having a hard time. Like, wow, not like, I'm going to get you back. How dare you do that to me? Like, it, it's uh, real classy. Yeah. I, thought, I thought it was very classy. Okay, before, before we get to our interview with Kyle, um, let me pour you a shot. Are you nervous about this? I'm not going to give you a big shot because um, I know that you're... Uh, yeah, let's go with training wheels. It's early in the day. Yeah. Training wheels are limes. We're not going to do limes. Okay. Uh, if you're listening to this and not watching, I am pouring. Well, as you're pouring... Christian, a little baby shot of tequila, and then I'm taking I, a real... I've got a nice one. A but, real shot. Now, what you're going to notice about this tequila is the burn is on the back, not on the front. Oh, this okay. Is good. This is good tequila clear so uh let's talk about who are who are toast yeah well well for. before that i was gonna let you know too so uh, i went out to a restaurant last night a pretty busy place pretty crowded and uh sitting there eating and then all of a sudden someone stood up and said does anyone know cpr and i raised my hand i'm like yeah and i know all the other letters in the alphabet everyone in the restaurant laughed except one person <laughs> the one that needed CPR. <laughs> the one dying on the floor. <laughs> That's it's always great when somebody's dying, Christian, for you to inject a little humor. That's right. Moment. A little levity. I gotta keep everybody under emotional control. It's my responsibility. People will as react a better to the emergency if they if they sense a little levity, a little yeah, lightness exactly. in the moment. So uh, Christian and I just got back uh, from Florida and we spoke at an annual meeting for the Morgan Auto Group an incredible group that's that's growing very fast and talk about a, a collection of talent I, incredible but larry morgan so i think he's 79 i think so yep so he has an incredible story in the sense that he started off in tires grew one of the largest independent tire uh retail tire businesses in the country. He was selling more tires, I think, than anybody. Sold it and then started buying car dealerships. And there's more to the story than that, but he should be the one telling his story. We've we've tried to get him on the show before, haven't we? I think so. Yeah, but we should try that again because he's such such an amazing icon in in our industry. And um, you know, we're just we're lucky to have clients like that and to be around people that are just so good for the industry and care about people and are building teams of performers and collecting talent in such a positive atmosphere. It was so great to to uh, to speak at their event and uh, spend time with with them and Larry and you know talking to him. So cheers to Larry Morgan. <laughs> Let me chase it with coffee. Mm hmm. So the burns in the back on that, I see. <laughs> <laughs> the burn might be from the very beginning for you because you don't, you don't drink. So, um, yeah, icon in our industry, Larry Morgan. And we, uh, 
we consider them really good friends. So now let me introduce our next guest, Kyle Friedel. He's with the strategy team at Interstate Batteries, and they are doing this really cool thing for their clients where they produce webinars addressing topics and questions they're seeing regularly in the field. They asked me to present at this month's webinar, and it focused on building your customer base through building trust. To register for the Pro Clinic tomorrow, Tuesday, April 5th, you can click the link in the description and see earlier episodes at interstatebatteries.com slash pro clinic. That's internet interstate batteries. I can't talk now. Can't <laughs> it's all downhill from yeah. here, kids. <laughs> Interstatebatteries.com slash pro clinic. So here's the interview. So Kyle, you know the the first time I realized how important batteries were was um I gotta say like I was barely 16 and I was working a part-time summer job at an RV dealership as a porter mm -hmm. and I'm um, in the front of the dealership washing you know trailers I used to wash them and this guy pulls in with a pickup truck with a camper on it to get propane right in front of our propane tank. That was one of my jobs is I would have to uh -huh. fill up the propane tanks for people that came in. And he pulls in, jumps out, pops the hood, and pulls the uh, maybe the ground off the battery, and the thing exploded. So that's how he was uh, starting and turning off the truck uh -huh. because I guess the starter wasn't working or something. But when he went to pull it off to shut it off, the whole thing exploded and he got battery acid all over his face and body. And then he starts screaming. And it, you know, when things like that happen, it kind of feels like slow motion. And I remember uh, thinking like, I should probably hose this guy down. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm washing a trailer, right? So I run over there with the hose and I'm literally spraying him right in the face uh. with the water. And he's like, yes, more, please more. And, uh, Ended up going to the hospital and everything. Like that was my very first experience. Is the battery just exploded and there was acid. So are batteries the same? Um, I know they're not because you don't even put water in batteries anymore, do you? There are some that you do, and, and some are maintenance free. Yeah, but how have batteries evolved since then? Yeah. So what you've just described, our our battery experts at our lab would call rapid disassembly, and uh, that's not a good thing. It's never a good thing. Um, I think, you know, what, what has happened is more that the cars have evolved and, and they've changed. They've added so much to cars. Uh, you know, there's about 50 computers, separate CPUs in an in average car and up to 100 in a higher end car. So you've got more electronics, more creature comforts than ever that are drawing power from that alternator and that battery. And the batteries had to be, have been, if they've evolved, it's more in the build and the plates and the straps that hold the plates together. We have, we have some videos of, you know, we have a, in our lab, we've got a big bandsaw that we can cut open batteries with and test to make sure that the OE, you know, the manufacturer specs are what they say they are. Um, but you've got thicker plates, different lead solutions in there, but it's still essentially lead, uh, a lead paste. And that's all for con conductivity to take the power out of the battery. And then you've got electrolyte, which is just distilled water and acid, sulfuric acid. So essentially it's the same, but the design, the build has changed to accommodate all these electrons. Do they last longer or is it strategic that they die after three years so people have to replace them? I really don't think it's strategic, but you know, over three to four years, you're gonna have evaporation caused by the heat in the battery and they, they are gonna die just based on, you know, it's more use, it's a better battery than it used to be, but it's just being challenged more than it ever was. So uh, you've got maintenance free, batteries like AGM batteries, but you, you do also have batteries that can be, you can add distilled water to, uh, to, to raise that, that um, coolant level. The water is cooling the battery so it'll last longer. Um, but mostly test it, you know, keep an eye on it. Have it tested whenever you go in for regular maintenance. But they, they truly don't really last that much longer, right? No, I, I think they last about the same. So I'm talking about, uh, you know, I'm 50, so that had to be 35 years ago, 34 years ago. In 34 years, batteries don't go 10 years. Like they don't last any longer really than they did when I was a kid, right? 
you know, it depends on what you're driving, what you're doing with it, and where you're driving it. So in a hot climate, it's, gonna, it's not going to last as long. In a, in a cooler climate, up in Seattle, those batteries can go a long time. So we have had batteries come back that we'll pull them off the truck, and they've got old our Bobby Labonte labels on there from when he was our NASCAR driver, and that, that can be like 10 years old, yeah. So you can have them last a long time, but it, it just depends on the heat, where you're driving them, how you're driving them, and um, yeah, the, you know, the, what the application is, what the car is pulling from the battery. So one thing that, that I find with shops is they most of the time don't understand how to create a pricing strategy for what they're selling for labor because there's different types of labor. And along with that labor are parts, right? And a battery is a, is a part. And oftentimes they think that maintenance is all, you know, one thing that has to be competitive, but really there's different things in maintenance that need to be competitive. And one of the things that I always find, especially in colder climates or warmer climates, is batteries drive traffic whenever there's a shift in season. So whenever there's a cold snap, people need a battery, they go out, it's cranking slow or it won't start and they have to jump it. The first thing they do is call and they want to know, do you have it and how much? And oftentimes that's one of the most overlooked like people will say, um, oh, well, we're competitive on alignments. And I'm always like, how many people are calling shopping a price of an alignment? Not very many. But when people need a battery, they're picking up the phone and it's, do you have it and how much? And so when I create pricing strategies, I always price batteries to be competitive in the sense that I know that they're going to bring people in and they're going to drive traffic. And also think about the psychology of a customer is if you go out, and you, ex you know, when you go out to get in your car in the morning, like that's kind of an unconscious thing, right? It's like, yeah, you don't want to think about your battery. You're in a script and you know, you're just getting in. And then when you have that surprise of, oh no, it's turning slow or, oh, it doesn't start. Now I got to get a jump. You, um, you're way more open to the idea of when we do an inspection, Maybe we should, maybe we should fix that oil leak. Maybe we should replace those belts, whatever it is, because that unforeseen surprise has you in a state of, oh, I don't want that to happen again. Yeah. And so batteries drive traffic in, they create an opportunity for you to do an inspection. And they also create a mindset of wanting to maintain and prevent surprises. Mm -hmm. So pricing them strategically is very effective you know, the northern part of the U.S. and the southern part where it's really hot, and uh, Canada for sure. Like, and, and you've got your product grades within there too. So it, Interstate would have a, an M-Line, an MT, and an MTP, and an MTX. All, you know, I think that's where it's important for customer service advisors. You, you made the point, ask why. You know, I need a new battery. Why? Well, it didn't start. And then dig in. What do you, you know, why did it die? Did it die as, you know, it's four or five years old, and that's okay, you know, but it's like, it's only two years old. Well, why, ask, tell me more about what you're running. It's like, well, I've got this massive stereo system, and I've put in these aftermarket televisions and, you know, uh, satellite systems and things like that. So, well, perhaps, Mr. Customer, you, you should consider upgrading to this AGM uh, battery rather than the, the factory spec, you know, one that's just a little bit lower. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I have a new Range Rover and I want to upgrade the stereo mm -hmm. because it's got a factory stereo and that factory stereo is okay, but it's not loud enough for me. I need it louder. It's very clean, mm. but uh, I was driving this morning coming here and I was wishing that there was more, like I was wishing it went to 11 and I bet I would have to upgrade the battery to do that. You can, you should find out for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it can't hurt, you know, an AGM is going to last a lot longer anyway. But, you know, some people, you, you want to be conscious of what their budget is, but you also don't want to sell them something that they're going to have to return early because nobody's going to be happy about that. So what do you see in, in shops or dealerships that are selling the most batteries? What is their mindset? And then what is the system that they're consistently doing that's creating that outcome? Yeah, so we work with um, large accounts, large uh I worked personally on the, the Firestone Complete Auto Care, and the shops that did it best were, it was about leadership. 
you know, it was top-down leadership. The, the, the owner or the manager said, we're going to test every car. Now, we know that's not actually possible because um, our best national account tests about 60% of cars. Um, oh, really? Yeah, and our, even once we did a, a pilot with our own interstate people in service base testing every car they could, and you could only test about 80% because sometimes it's, it, re, it might require removing upholstery or back seats, oh. or you've got a battery that's, you know, it's, it's kind of an afterthought for engineers. They've put it in the trunk under the spare tire, and, you know, it's just impossible to get that customer in and out and, and to, to test that. Plus, you get a lot of voltage drop in that long line from, from the battery to the engine, so it's not an accurate test. So really can only test about 60 to 80 percent is, is about the most you're going to be able to do. But if the manager is saying, we're going to test every car we can, and then he empowers the customer service advisors, look, if you get an RO, it needs to have a battery test attached to it. And if you don't, you, have the, you are empowered to go to that technician and ask, hey, wh where's the battery test? And if they said they can't do it, just jot a note on there, and then the manager spot checks it you know, a couple times a week just to go through the ROs and make sure that the battery is, in fact, being tested. So say, the leadership saying we're going to test everyone we possibly can and then um, holding people accountable to that and empowering them to hold people accountable, uh, it's that simple. Well, and then I mean, this is, this is what, I, what I wanted to talk to you about is like it's also about delivering that message to the customer. And three out of four times you've got a chance to say, hey, good news, battery's fine, we tested it, should be fine. Or... Yeah, it's looking a little iffy. You should come back in in a couple of months. Let's test it again. And the more you do that, the more you build that credibility, the more they're going to trust you when it is time to replace. Yeah, so I always look at that as a deposit or equity with the customer. So all the times that you tell them that it checked out okay, whether it's the battery or the inspection, you're creating equity in the sense that if the first time you ever mention the inspection is when they need to buy something, that there's a, there can be mistrust there. Not always. Like you're being upsold something. The good news kind of like, you know, it builds equity. Like, hey, it should be okay and it is okay. So, yeah. hey, but just taking the time to mention it is a deposit in an, in the future. I think you called it a trust fund? I'm one of your episodes. No. Somebody called it that, but I'm, uh, I'm stealing it from whoever said it. I have a story in my advisor book about a rich uncle. Okay. Is that what you mean? In, well, the, the term just applies here. It's like putting deposits. Yeah. And Same of trust, yeah. But, yeah, that, that's a, I don't know how I heard that. What do you think about, uh, so, the Teslas and all that, like, are you guys worried about, no, that's, you know, that's are you going to make a battery totally for Teslas? Totally different animal. Um, but they're getting market share. Like, I have one. Yeah, t yeah, Tesla's going to continue getting market share, but this is a platform of batteries, of cells, lithium-ion cell batteries that sit underneath I can't speak to, to Tesla, but in a Nissan Verse, Versa, for instance, I saw our leaf. I, I've seen the, the undercarriage of that, and, and that's, you can't, nobody is, re, is making replacement batteries for that because it's a whole platform of batteries. Only the OEs are doing that. I don't even know if they're doing it in the dealerships. Do you know? If you can take your electric vehicle to, like your Chevy Volt, to the dealership and they can work on the, on the platforms there? Yeah. Yeah, and for for a lot of them you can, um, and I mean that started back with the Prius where they were they were replacing them too, um, but like so for example the Nissan Leaf, mm -hmm. how much how much maintenance is there on the Nissan Leaf? Well, brake fluid, yeah, alignments and tires, yeah, no oil, right? No the, bat, no. There's a starting battery. There is a starting battery actually in a Tesla and a and a. Um, all electric vehicles, they have a starting battery in, I can't remember which one I was looking at it, but it's under the spare tire in the trunk, and that starts the whole system. But that's the, still their proprietary battery, right? No, no, you can just use an interstate replacement battery. In a Tesla? Can't speak specifically to a Tesla, but I was talking to our, our partners, Jeff Barron and Gail Kimbrough in our lab, and they're like, yeah, there's, there are starting batteries in all of these cars. So don't quote me on Tesla, but I'll get, I can find out and get back to you. I, th I think the next three or four years we're, we're going to, you know, because of new cars and what's happening with supply and demand, we're going to be really, you know, successful in the service side of things. But I worry 10 years out. Like, what are, what are we going to sell when 
electric cars are 40 or 50 percent of the market mm -hmm. i mean i get that question a lot too yeah I, i'll get you a better answer but yeah there are definitely starting batteries in electric vehicles and it's a, it's a 12 volt lead acid battery so any, just in closing and wrapping it up is there anything else that we missed about batteries that make them fun or sexy or so well there's nothing about batteries that make them sexy uh I'm trying one of our favorite uh it's a headline that i wrote that goes on the side of our trucks it just says buy it forget it the other side of the truck says, you'll love this battery if you ever think about it. So if we're doing our job, you're not thinking about your battery. Um, but I think what's important for people to know is, is, it, is it heat that is causing the deterioration of that battery? And then, uh, you know, the evaporation and, and additional corrosion inside as the water evaporates, acid starts corroding the plates. That's normal over time. But over three or four or five years, as that battery is weakened, that's when that cold snap comes in and kind of delivers the, the, the killing blow, right? Puts the nail in the coffin. Can also be uh, what they what our lab calls a parasitic draw, which I think would be a great band name, right? It would be. Um, so leaving your lights on, or sometimes they have to hunt down. Uh, there's a, a short in the switch in the trunk light, and you had no idea, but this light is on all the time, and so that's why your battery is dying prematurely, or it's an alternator problem. And that's, again, why you gotta test, because you don't wanna replace a battery when the alternator's the problem. So. So leadership, consistently test, empower them to hold them accountable. And deliver that good news. Yeah. Deliver that good, good news. deposits. Thanks so much. Fun. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Service Job Revolution. We're uploading new stuff every day, so make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon so you don't miss out. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, call 8333-ASK-SDR and we'll answer your question on the show. That's 8333-ASK-SDR. For special deals on our books and training, head over to offers.chriscollinsinc.com. Now that's offers.chriscollinsinc.com. I'm Chris Collins and I'll see you in the next video.